Welcome everybody to our webinar on a very trendy format, digital format, Ask Me Anything sessions. I'm really happy to have our partners here from the Independent and Viafora, Philippa Jenkins and Matthew Harrison, and introduce them a bit later. My name is Martin. I'm the director of Digital Revenue Network at Vanifra, and we are hosting this webinar today for you. Good afternoon, Lorenzo. In the chat. Um, I came across a certain quote several times, and the quote goes like that. Content is king, but engagement is queen, and the lady rules the house. To be honest, I don't know who said it, but it's, I think, one of the core messages today in digital business in the media industry. So, but how to engage users, how to make them come to you, stay with you. And one of the, I think, most underrated formats is the Ask Me Anything question, beziehungsweise um, session. And the Independent in the UK did it very successfully and showed how it can help to get registrations and subscriptions. And how this was done, we will get to know from uh, Philippa Jenkins today, who is uh, the head of registered audience there. And the tool that was used to do it will be presented by Matthew Harrison, who is manager for customer success at Viafura, both are from the UK. And welcome to you. Just to have our audience, um, how we do it today, we will have two short presentations. And if you have very urgent questions, just put them in the Q&A function. It can be seen down here. But in the end, we will have, of course, a session for more questions as well. Something like a ask me anything session in the end about our subject today. So you are here not for me, but for Philippa and Matthew. So I'll hand over to Philippa, please. Thanks, Martin. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining. I'll um, share my slides, just explain a little bit more about, first of all, my role, and then a bit about the independence, and then take you through our journey that has happened over the past 18 months or so with Ask Me Anything specifically. Um, let me just share my screen. Hopefully you can all see that, hang on. Great, so to kick off, um, as Martin said, <clears throat> I'm, um, I've had a couple of different roles since I joined the Independent, which was purely to drive our 80K strategy, which is our anonymous to known strategy that really kicked off in April 2021. Um, since then, I've taken on different parts of the business as well, um, but have continued to help drive that acquisition of uh, registrations and grow our registered audience. And as part of that, we have teamed up with the Fury, which I'll talk through a little bit. Um, first of all, just to give context as to who we are as, as the independent, for those who, who might not know, um, we're based in the UK, but um, have a presence across the across the globe and a very much a outward looking global operation. Um, and in terms of our history, as you can see, we launched back in, in 86 and actually have um, had one of the most significant changes in more recent times back in 2016 when we took the quite radical decision as a business to close our print product. So the, the paper as it was then came to an end and we focused entirely on digital since that point um, so those are really the kind of the, the key areas that people often um, focus on us as a leading part in in how we've evolved as some uh, a body that likes to be across digital and, and how we do that so moving on to what that's looked like in terms of registrations um, back, as I say, in 2021, our focus on anonymous to known really started to take off. Um, and the idea around that was, as Martin alluded to, the fact that engagement is known to come with that and the fact that we know how valuable as a result those registered users particularly are, as you can see from some of those numbers there, the fact that they are generally 11 times more engaged than the users who are anonymous to us. Um, and equally, even more so when you're then looking at subscribers, um, which is then 62 times more. So as you can see, that then creates an ongoing snowball effect effectively of, of how you then can grow that audience. And as a result, at the same time, your engagement. 
So that's where our acquisition model began. Um, and it then led to this projection of growth around that um, due to various different focuses as to how we in, um, how we evolved and how we strategized around some of the focuses in particular parts of the business that included, as you can see on that slide, um, a combination of really different offerings, anything from our newsletter portfolio through to um, our lead generation campaigns, which have been paid for across social media um, to drive those signups uh, through to things like competitions um, and then also virtual events as well. And as you can see, that's then seen that upward trajectory over that period of 18 months or so, which um, has been a really thankfully successful picture throughout. So as part of that journey, one of the reasons why we were able to capitalize on the success that we were having was our partnership with Via Fiora. So we partnered with them very early on because one thing that we realized was that we had to nail our value exchange really quickly if we were to see any substantial growth. Because, of course, if we're asking users to sign up to us um, as a media outlet, they need something in return. So that was then the way that we wanted to build our community offering, which was how we did that with Via Fiora's commenting platform. So that was then something that we were able to build on as well as other elements, including our registration gate that we launched at a similar time as well, so that we ask users to register um, to then obviously get those extra benefits. But it's not a, it's not a hard gate. It's a gate that you have the option um, on the majority of content across the site to then um, say that you would like to look at that later and you can then continue to look at the, the content for free. So. In terms of what that uh, relationship with Vifura then led to, I can then take you through one of the key areas that we focused on as part of our um, commenting platform that we then launched with Vifura. And that's our Ask Me Anything, as Martin alluded to at the beginning. Um, it's been a really interesting journey and one that um, has had lots of successes on, along the way, but not to divert from the fact that it has certainly been a journey. And as part of that, there's also been things that we've tried and tested and haven't worked and have had to look other areas which I'll explain a bit about now um, and I think it's important to acknowledge that that it's certainly not been something that we tackled from the beginning and it was a success the whole way through we certainly um, looked at different ways of doing things when they haven't necessarily been as successful as we hoped so what the offering looks like is a scenario where we have our regular AMAs, which are hosted by our in-house writers. And then we also um, have our expert AMAs, which are hosted by external people who are experts in their fields, ranging across a number of different topics uh, that are relevant to the news agenda at any one time. Um, and those are then done at regular slots throughout any month so that um, people know that they've got a particular time where they are then uh, able to interact either with our in-house staff or whether it's with external people <clears throat> we try and create a really combined offering at any one time so how do we get here there were some challenges as I've mentioned um, first of all definitely the way that um, we wanted to try and tackle the way that we had new content was how we got to the point of having experts. I think one thing that people at particular times then seemed to be less engaged with was where we were trying to apply our in-house writers against any topic that might be of interest at any one time. It wasn't as simple as that. We had to really fine tune what the topic was to make sure that our audience was fully engaged with that, engaged enough to actually ask a question in our commenting widget, um, but also to align that with the right person that they actually would want uh, an answer from. And obviously the whole process of an Ask Me Anything where we are asking users to be logged in, we're asking them to be engaged in the topic. And then the last step of actually being engaged enough to go right to the bottom of the article, be on the widget where the commenting happens and then actually submit their question themselves. So it's a, it's quite a long process when you break it down like that. And obviously you've got to have all of those elements combined to ensure that they see that through. 
So the other part of that that then uh, I certainly would describe as a challenge as we've been resourcing the whole way through, you've obviously got to ensure that you've got a balance of people both internally who are able to do that and dedicate the time to it at any one point of the week, but also you've got to be looking for people externally who are willing to give up whatever it might be that you're asking them to, um, to set aside for doing an Ask Me Anything, which can be generally around an hour. Um, and then next it's around the promotion and how to get that right it's been an interesting one to trial because there's definitely been ways that have worked better than others and that includes anything from getting the timing right in terms of when you're pushing out on social that you are hosting and ask me anything uh through to actually then making sure that people aren't just then asking questions on the either the staff members twitter profile or the external experts profile on twitter and then it doesn't actually get through to being an ask me anything on the site so that's one that we certainly had to tackle along the way um to ensure that actually the the Q&A is happening on the website rather than on a third party platform. Um, and also, obviously, as well, then questioning each time what format should be for each particular topic. Do we focus on assigning somebody internally to it? Do we try and seek out an expert that would be best aligned to that? And also then as part of that, working out what topics people are comfortable with in terms of actually asking a question and putting their name to it even if it's just their commenting name there's certainly a sense that there's a barrier there at times if it's a topic that's slightly too um uncomfortable or personal in a way that then would make them feel more hesitant if it's around a area of health for instance you can then notice that there's sometimes a slight hesitancy around that engagement so here are some examples as to what our ask me any things uh, have actually then look like along the way. Simon Calder, our travel correspondent, has had the biggest success um, throughout this period of time, particularly obviously during COVID as well, where people were completely thrown as to what they could and couldn't do with travel. Um, he was their go-to person in terms of actually getting information around their next trip or what they were hoping to do. So those have been a real success and he hosts them every week. As the travel picture has changed as COVID restrictions have eased. The engagement with those have also changed despite him being such a fountain of information. We've actually reduced those um, to every other week more recently because people's questions then are much more tailored around the particular um, news agenda of that week around travel particularly which works a lot better uh, to actually try and gather everyone in one space um, but that again shows how you have to adapt at any one time to reflect not only the interest but also the news agenda as well This is an example of an internal writer's Ask Me Anything that was one that we launched fairly early on. You can see the date on that article of um, May in 2021. Um, and it's a good example of where we were trying to capitalize on something that obviously everyone was interested in and talking about at the time in terms of lockdown lifting um, and using one of our in-house experts who was uh, our um, health correspondent who was then able to answer questions. We felt as though there wasn't as much engagement around that as we'd like. And that's when we started looking at other options in terms of bringing in, as an example, uh, expert in COVID to actually then get some answers around what you should and shouldn't do around lockdown lifting and what's safe and what's not. And this then shows the result of that where we then brought on an expert um, and the engagement was a lot higher we had more questions we had further back and forth conversation within the comments as well where people were really trying to get the most out of the fact that they had that one-on-one -on -one interaction with an expert at their fingertips that obviously we were offering them on our platform which is the whole usp effectively of the whole project And lastly, this example is one from earlier this year, which was a real success. And again, is a very different topic, as you'll see, something much more lighthearted that clearly at the time, but still now is something people are really interested in. 
um, and actually want some answers, how how they can tackle Word or how can they get the best out of it. And um, our expert that we got on board in terms of uh, answering those questions with a linguist. And you can see from this piece that there was a really good conversation going on and um, people were really pleased with the fact that they had that opportunity to talk around the topic that at the time everyone was talking about. So the next thing I wanted to talk about was um, how do we go about actually communicating that in terms of the fact that we have this offering on the site, the fact that people need to be aware that we have these regular AMA sessions um, and how people can get involved in them themselves. I think a really simple way to do that is being very open and effective with the communication by having the details on the site very prominently and then regularly putting those out on social so that people are aware and you've got new users coming to you who might not have noticed this particular feature on the site before and that you're then being very explicit in how to do it and what they can get out of it and what they can expect and I don't think that being <clears throat> there's never enough openness in terms of letting the users know what to expect and why they might want to get involved themselves and I think that that's always a really good place to start at in terms of building that relationship with them from the first point that they might want to start signing up and registering with you as an outlet. So what have all of this led to in terms of the results? As you can see, over the past 12 months, we've had some really brilliant success, particularly with the Ask Me Anythings in terms of those driving registrations, but also driving um, article views and traffic for the site as well. So from just that small sample, it's driven nearly one and a half million article views, um, but at the same time, getting closer to 6,000 registrations. Um, and also just in that particular snapshot as well, it's actually had an incredible increase from where we started to where we are now um, in terms of that uplift of 900%. Um, so that certainly has led us to want to just expand wherever we can because we know that the value is so, is so thorough in each aspect. So what about the lessons that we've learned? I think it's really important to not be over ambitious. I think at times we try to combine things that make it more complicated where we've had more than one person, for instance, being involved in an Ask Me Anything. We've had organizations being involved where they've wanted a few different representatives at one time. That can be really quite noisy and can I think be quite confusing for the user. I think we've had the best success or actually we've had the focus on effectively one conversation with one voice coming back to people in terms of their response. Responses. Um, and I think that that's a good example of where you can be tricked into wanting to be over ambitious and actually it's better to be simple where possible. In terms of promotion, I've talked about that a couple of times and I think it's really important to be aware that there is no rigid formula. It's certainly a case by case basis with each ask me anything that we find um, in terms of how we might want to promote that particularly uh, because it will mean that there's a different audience to go after because of the nature of the topic but also because particularly if you're liaising with experts they actually have their own community to liaise with themselves and get people on board through that channel so there's always different scenarios and I think you have to adapt to those at any one time to get the best results another one is definitely be consistent allow people to know that they can rely on returning to the website because they know that you've got a regular program of ask me any things and they can expect to see those week in week out that really helps because it acts as a call to action to return to the site and for them to seek out what ask me anything you might have next on the agenda and be highlighting and promoting that as well from one ask me anything to the next ask me anything so they know you know you're letting them know that they can mark that up and be aware that that next one is happening at a set point the following week and I think the last thing is certainly to know and trust the technology that you're using, which we've certainly found with how we've used the Vifura's platform to enable this to happen. A really good example of that is the fact that we regularly, as explained, have external people logging on to then host our Ask Me Anythings. And I think there's sometimes a hesitancy around how complicated that might be and whether there'll be any issues for those people doing that at any one time because they're coming to a platform that they're not used to using. I think what's been a real bonus is it's such an easy and simple process for them to follow. 
themselves that actually it's been really quite simple to get them to on board, not feel too flustered by what they're being asked to do. And in terms of the engagement that they enjoy having, it's a win-win scenario because actually they get as much out of it as the users do themselves by actually getting the answers from the experts um, who are there on hand for that dedicated period of time. And those are the key lessons that we've found certainly over the past 18 months. Matthew, over to you. Uh, thanks for that. Thanks for that, Philippa. Well, very interesting to, to hear about your experiences of, of doing the AMAs and the success that you've actually had with them using our platform and obviously working with your experts. Uh, having been a part of uh, troubleshooting a few of the technical issues, it's, it's always been a, a fun road to be, uh, be on. Um, if, you, if we could move on to the, the next slide, um, I'll just give a, a brief overview of uh, about Viafora. So we are a, an, a, digi a digital experience company, but, and what we try and do is help brands activate you know, their digital audiences. And we do this via a variety of different mechanisms. Um, so what we try and do is we help create registrations. So we provide different value exchange moments for your audience to convert reasons why they would give up their data and, and the ability for their data to be collected. Um, we work on retention. So we help drive recency, frequency, volume and retention um, to try and replicate, um, you know, your audience habits that they have on social, social media, but we try and make that experience more immersive on your owned and operated sites. And then thirdly, through revenue, um, we help with driving increased engagement um, that I'll go into on the next slide, but that has a greater ec ec economic impact on, you know, your page revenues. Um, so keeping people on site more longer care and making each individual user generate more page views. Um, so on to the next slide. Um, some of the ways that we look at uh, our customers and their users and their audience is we break it down into different segments as to how we see those audiences. So we look at anonymous users. These are the people that either click through from Instagram, Facebook or Twitter or a quick, you know, AMP link or a, a Google search link. Uh, onto the site, they have a very brief read of an article and then they leave again. You can see next to the anonymous user base that they are the, the big percentage of any uh, publisher's website, uh, generally speaking, and they create a, you know, a small amount of page views and a small amount of drive dwell time on average over the course of a month. The R and the F and the V is uh, about uh, reach and frequency um, and volume. So recency is, you know, was the user active today or was it, were they active, you know, 10 days ago? Frequency is um, the average days the user is actually active across the course of a month. And then volume obviously is the average amount of page views per user per day. Um, so it's very interesting to look at very many, many different clients across the board in terms of how their user base actually um, looks within the anonymous engaged so an engaged user would be someone who spends more than three seconds in the comments likes the comments or clicks on any of the uh, different digital experiences that we provide on site um, and then obviously a registered user is fairly self-explanatory and then a UGC contributor is someone who actually comments now that very small segment at the bottom is generally speaking 0.1 to 1%, maybe to the highest, maybe 3% of a publisher's um, uh, total audience. Yet the effect of those users there, if, if you don't have those users on site who are commenting or liking or anything, you don't get the ability to get that engaged audience. And as you can sort of see from the page views that the engaged and the registered and the, and, the, and the UGC contributors create, they are the most valuable type of users um, to the business. Um, uh, and that, that's, that's kind of, it's, it's, it's a funny one really, because I look at the independence data and I see how they've changed over uh, the course of the last two years since we've been working together um, and how different um implementations of products on different pages whether it's to do with notification bells whether it's to do the promotion of amas and broadcast notifications 
And I see I've got a couple of other clients on this call, actually, from uh, Jedi in Italy, who have La Repubblica and La Stampa, and they have a very different setup. And I look at this chart on the independent versus um, Jedi's, and they're very, very different due to the way that the different sites are set up. And it's a it's a very interesting way to look at our, our different sites. And speaking of other clients, if I could move on to the next slide, please. Um, so Via Fora is a Canadian company based out of Toronto, but we are actually a global company um, with brands all across North America, Europe, Middle East, um, and, and, and Canada itself, as well as where it started, um, working with Reach PLC, Telegraph, The Independent, The Evening Standard, GRV Media. Uh, I don't have Jedi's um, uh, symbol on here, but Davida is one of my main points of contact, who's actually uh, in the attendee list here. Um, I did ask him, hopefully, not to uh, ask me any terrible questions afterwards. But uh, um, yeah, it's it's nice to see everybody here. Um, but that's about it on, on my side. Unless, and I'd like to open up the floor to any of the attendees to ask Philippa or myself any questions about uh, anything that Philippa said or anything that I've said. Thanks a lot, you both. That was a very interesting insight and the numbers Philippa presented, they stunned me, to be honest. That's a very successful format you invented there or you just put up for your users. We haven't had a question in the Q&A now, but I think there will be some coming. But I have a question for you, Philippa. You said you are doing it regularly once a month, uh, the AMA. How important was that to do it on a regular basis? Is this like... Uh, making users get used to it or is there a danger that maybe people say like okay um we are too used to it to have it every month is there some some development yeah i think it's an interesting one because i think without any kind of schedule being created for users it does fall into that trap of them being less engaged around the whole format itself regardless of whether it's being particularly engaged on one specific AMA um, and I think at the point that we've ever had the most being done at any one time generally that then aligns with those having the highest engagement as well and so I do think that as a result it is effectively a snowball effect that the more you do and the more consistent you can be the better return you get as a result because apart from anything else I think the proof is there for your users that actually you're investing in that extra added value that you have promised you're going to be offering them as a registered user. So I think in that sense, it's a very fair exchange of value in that you're offering them something regularly and they are returning to you to take that up. Um, and it's as simple as that, I think. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I, I think on that with the way that the independent have done it, it's it's really it's a, such a fantastic way of trying to improve and increase loyalty with the actual audience base, because you're highlighting the fact that you're doing an AMA and you're going to listen to them, whether it's you know an expert from outside or inside, is that the independent is providing a home for somewhere, and you know you can ask a question and you will be listened to and given an answer. And I think sort of when we've spoken to lots of different clients. Um, you know, being able to have that that two way street between user and publisher and actually being heard as opposed to just being, you know, another number or another person on the page. Um, it really does, you know, Im improve loyalty and retention. Mm -hmm. And how do you promote these uh, AMA sessions? So it's a combination of um, using all of our social media channels to let people know. And I think the key thing as well is around timing on that, because mm -hmm. there's a combination, I think, that works really well, where you give people the heads up that it's happening, for instance, the following week, but also being very hot on letting people know on the day as well and not being afraid to go right mm -hmm. up to the wire in terms of the promotion, because actually, in terms of the format, it's obviously really easy to engage with because in reality, you can be at work typing away on your screen and actually have the AMA live next to you as well on a separate tab. It's as simple as that. So I think the fact that you can promote it all the way up to the point of kicking off is also a real 
key bonus because it means that people have got all opportunities to sign up and it's not as though they've got to set aside a particular point of their week as such um, because it is so easy to get involved with um, and I think the other thing is also being really aware of how to remote it through the individuals as well so whether that's through our internal writers and using their own social media profiles or whether it's the external experts profiles as well it both ways it's as important as each other because especially where we're then leaning on those external experts to use their different communities that are completely removed from our own platform mm -hmm. you're then able to tap in to an audience that you might not have ever really reached before so that's really valuable for their buy-in to that as well which often is is really easy because they understand that if they are agreeing to it in the first place there's an element from their perspective that they obviously want it to be a success and they want to let people know that they're available for that set period of time so I think all of that works really well and it's not a problem to have those conversations it's usually very easy and actually works really well for them and did you also have to promote the idea in your newsrooms to get colleagues doing these sessions I remember the very old saying journalism would be very nice if it wasn't for the readers um, because they might ask questions that we don't expect or we cannot answer them so how was the promotion inside your company yeah and I think it's a really valid point because of course depending on the topic you can naturally expect some difficult questions on one side of things but you can also always have that risk of a really low engagement rate and actually setting up an AMA and not really many people turning up and not many answers, uh, not many questions being asked, which can actually in those instances where you've asked a member of staff to get involved in it in the first place and then, then not have anyone come to them can be really demoralizing. So that's certainly been situations that we've had to deal with along the way and has been part of that journey in terms of making them work better for us and understand where the need is to apply an expert from outside rather than use a staff member so that we navigate our way around those situations to not have an AMA set up and actually no questions being asked. Um, and, you know, it, it, there's been really tough instances of that. And we've had scenarios where to try and drive the higher engagement, we've had internal people asking questions in the, in the um, comments. And I think that it's important to be transparent about that and, let others know that there are all avenues to go down before you necessarily kind of find the right formula that works for you as a publication and we've certainly had those moments where we've either thought uh, we need to pursue other ways to promote this to get a better engagement rate and get more people involved um, or we've simply had to end them early and we've certainly had to do that on a couple where we've realized we just haven't got it right in terms of the combination of the person hosting it and also the subject matter it's not worked for whatever reason in each instance and just realizing that and bringing it to a close and moving on to the next one and working out what else we want to do for for the following topic so I would like to encourage our attendees to put some questions in the Q&A channel. Um, I'm Lorenzo. Ah, this is Hi, the company you mentioned, Matthew. <laughs> yeah, I saw David around there. He's, the, he's my main point of contact at Teddy, but uh, I see Lorenzo's uh, uh, on the chat as well. Hi, Lorenzo. Ah, here's a question coming. I believe that you need content as AMA is an extremely more effective marketing lever than pricing or advertising levers. Could you comment that, Matthew? What do you think? Um, I feel that you need content. Ask me anything. Says an extremely more effective marketing lever than pricing or advertising. It is a natural way to reach the minds of consumers and differentiate yourself from competitors. Um, yeah, uh, Lorenzo, I, I definitely think, think um, making sure that there's a a popular niche subject where people are very much interested uh, and you have a unique value proposition within your organization. Uh, I mean, Simon Calder is the travel writer over at The Independent is, is, is one of the most fantastic ones as well. He, he is a very popular uh, journalist in the industry. So people are very much, he's got a very respected opinion and people, you know, will always, you know, almost take Simon Calder's word as the law. Um, because he is so much of an expert but I think uh, generating unique content is is a fantastic way of doing it 
And sort of, I just wanted to touch back on one of the other bits about, you know, sometimes the issue with promotions and whether you classify them as, as live. I mean, a, an expert can answer questions live, but when, when the promotion goes on, you can garner and harvest as many questions from users beforehand um, that may not be published on the site until such time as they do the live Q&A. Um, so you can kind of almost cache questions from users pre the live Q&A. And then obviously you can choose which questions are there and able for the expert to be actually answered use, using the technology, um, which is good. So, and do you have any idea, Matthew, about how common uh, that format of AMA sessions is at the moment? Um, I think every, well, like, like Philippa, so that Philippa mentioned, every, every publisher we work with has a very different audience base in terms of how active they are at certain times of the day, you know, what is the most popular reason that they go on there, you know, so, some vary to, to sports sites, to politics, to, to general news or, or travel. Uh, I have a, a, a very engaged South African client that, you know, garners more comments than anybody could ever imagine and you know whenever they do anything live it, it's it's it goes very crazy um but uh it's each to their own with the, with the different publishers and their audience space there's there's no one publisher that we work with is the same and it's a, a rinse and repeat we have best, some best practices that we we give where we've seen certain clients have success we will say to other clients you know this has been a successful format for this client um, here are a variety of different ways that you might want to 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 to, to implement this, uh, and we give them you know some advice and guidance as to, to what we do. Um, another question to Philippa: Do you have any other interactive formats you use at the Independent? Yeah, so the another one that we have is our virtual event series, and that's interactive in the sense that um, it's very similar format to this, and it's uh, all held on Zoom, and people can then interact with the host and the panelists via using um, the chat box and the Q and A, and they can also pre-submit questions as well that are then fed in to the host and the the panelists ahead of the event taking place. Um, so that's another format that we offer in terms of having that one-on-one. -on -one um, ability to actually get some kind of um, communication answers from experts in the field. Mm -hmm. And do you have any new plans, further plans, for how you could go on with the AMA series, like new tracks, new topics you want to cover? I think Simon's AMA format is something that is a real gold star version for us that we always want to try and replicate and i think that it's around how we can fine tune that even more going forward um and i think that how we can do that can be still worked on a lot more than we've done so far because it's, it's worked but like i say the uptake in that has actually dropped off more recently because of the fact that obviously the need for questions around travel has changed mm -hmm. so that's naturally going to change with obviously what people's life experience is at any one time. And I think that's really key to being able to adapt to that. And we are, but I think because of that, we certainly need to not only change what time we're offering them, but probably look at the format and work out how we can make that more engaging to the user. Um, but there are certainly other things that we would be really keen to trial. And one format that we tried along the way uh, which I didn't touch on in the presentation, which was something that was too resource heavy, was actually offering a scenario where people could ask their questions in the comments ahead of time. We then would host a live interview held on Zoom with a particular expert, and we would then pose the questions to them live on that Zoom, and we would then post the recording back on the site and um, communicate that to everyone who had uh, submitted a comment on the original piece so that we were effectively ho hosting a live interview Q&A but in a recorded format to allow people to access it at a time that was convenient to them like I say that was very resource heavy to do and in that sense the return wasn't as high as some of the other formats that we tried so we paused that but I do think that there is still something in that that means that we would probably revisit that at some point next year to try and see how we could make that work harder for us um, by including 
a, a visual element to it as well. Okay, we just have a question at the Q&A, but it's uh, very similar to the thing we just discussed. Any other formats like debates or consultations? Anything running like this or planned? So our, um, our virtual events are much more like a debating forum. Mm -hmm. um, they're generally billed as conversations because that's how we like them to be rather than become too heated but um that's certainly something that like i say has been a separate format but something that we've then used to try and replicate within the ama format as well uh, but there's nothing else that we offer in a similar way at the moment that those are the key things that we focus on you mentioned uh, the term resource heavy so was there a debate uh in your company about if you have the resources at all to do the ask me anything session format yeah, of course. And I think it's an, an ongoing balance in that sense where you are able to allow writers to take their time on and ask me anything versus actually writing a piece of content that's obviously going to drive traffic and drive revenue in that respect. Um, so it's a constant balance between obviously what you're catering for, for the audience and who that audience is, I think, and being mindful of that so that you're capitalizing on the right metric at any one time basically depending on the news agenda depending on resource depending on rotors that kind of thing so i think as long as you are taking all of those different factors in you can generally make it work regardless of how limited you might feel at any one time in terms of resource matthew as we are talking about other interactive formats uh, what about tools um if i I'm a company, I'm looking for the right tool to do interactive formats. What are important steps to go, questions to ask yourself? Um, I mean, obviously the different tools that we have, we have, you know, a live, a live blog tool. We, we use, the, you know, the live AMA tool, the Q&A and the conversation experience together. Um, we also have a live chat tool, which is more for rapid fire sort of discussion about certain topics. We work very well about, around politics and around sport, um, depending on like transfer windows or the NFL draft or a, a hockey draft. Um, there's some reaches. A, a UK publisher did some great experimentation with live chats and syndicating them across different um, publications that they have. So you had users from five different websites but all talking together around the same subject um, as a way of sort of um, combining your audience strength to create much more higher engagement um yeah sorry i just i noticed there was a a, a question from from yes. lorenzo as well question um, in the chat from lorenzo do you think the strength of ama is the fact that users can participate and interact with the brand one to one or is it the possibility for them of having personalized information? I think it's both. I think it's really important. I think that the the difficulty always lies in particularly a figure like Simon Calder. You know, he's got an incredible presence himself, um, particularly on social media. And so actually it's creating that distinction <clears throat> as to why people would want to come to the site to have that interaction with him or actually they could probably have it as easily on social media but I think as well when you're dealing with particular individuals actually as so often is found they don't have the capacity to come back to everybody who's contacting them on social media and so I think that marrying that up with actually then the brand that they're associated with like that example of Simon is then the perfect combination because you're you're providing an opportunity for that person to be available on your own platform and on the brand that obviously they're associated with and people are then trusting that that's where they can do it and they know they'll get an answer rather than necessarily putting it into the ether on social media and never knowing whether they might get a reply or not because it's just yeah. too busy it's too noisy on our platform they know that they 
will be responded to and that obviously they also have that sense of the other person effectively being on the other end and it's in those examples as well of the travel questions it is really personal it's it's questions about their specific travel it's real concerns that they have as well you know whether family members can get to see them a next scenario um which you know you can tell by the nature of some of the comments it's really quite distressing for some of them in some instances that they've been trying through other channels to get answers and solutions to whatever problem it is that they're facing but they know that Simon is probably the person to help them um and I think that that's the the key to it it's that element of trust um and the opportunity as much as anything else that then makes it work as well as it does yeah I, I think I mean on top of that I mean the the initial offering to a user uh, to be able to speak to an expert is fantastic but one of the reasons why obviously publishers do do this in the first place is to try and drive more registrations and and net new registrations by offering something different so you know the, the purpose of using any of this technology and any of these um, techniques is is to sometimes drive registrations on site so, you know, there's a big value exchange there from the investment of time from the publisher in terms of finding the right expert with the right unique content to promoting it, to getting those users then in front of it and registered and involved because, the, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, everybody wins from that scenario. There is there is value exchange on both sides. Um, you get the registrations, you get the first party data, you, you get, you know, the users then get also the, you know, the expert analysis or opinion or their questions answered by someone. So it's, it's an everybody, it's, it's an, it's a, it's a scenario where everybody wins if it's done nicely and, and correctly. And obviously there are always targets to hit for registrations with most businesses. For sure. Philippa, it, maybe it's a bit early because um, yeah, this format is in some ways still establishing, but could that some be some, some kind of a skill you will be looking for when you hire people that they can do such a format? Yeah, definitely. And I think it's easy in the sense that actually it's a skill that you'd want to see applied across a range of different platforms anyway, um, mm -hmm. that without that, it is a natural lacking in terms of a potential staff member skill set. I think it is really important for them to feel as though they are comfortable with the fact that they need to have that relationship with the audience that they're writing for. I think it's really important. And I think it's also important that as staff, they appreciate they've got the full support of the company. And of course, we do have situations where things can get quite heated in comments, not necessarily on AA, but because people are coming back on a piece that someone's written that they feel really quite strongly mm -hmm. about. And we obviously have to take decisions at any one time on those as to whether we are going to um, continue and allow comments to be posted or whether we're going to turn comments off. And I think it's that, again, I think it goes back to trust that obviously we expect a certain element um, from our members of staff to be willing to engage with the audience. Um, but at the same time, them to understand that they've got our support and clearly appreciate that there can be difficult scenarios that develop because of that, mm -hmm. because you're having that one on one contact. And I think it's a combination of that that means that hopefully they are always comfortable in doing it and having the conversation um, at any one time to navigate any of the problems that arise. So would you say there are certain topics that could not be the best ones for ask me anything sessions maybe just avoid them yeah definitely and i think it was a fine line particularly whilst we we're still in covid as well between navigating the ama that would provide information around things that people were very willing to talk about and discuss and need quite uh I guess quite urgently in some instances in terms of what they could and couldn't do versus then where you start delving more down the route of genuine health around a topic like COVID and actually that then becomes very different and people aren't as comfortable as posting in a comment maybe something in terms of their specific situation in terms of their health quite often that then becomes difficult and you feel as though people are more close to that because they don't want that in a public forum like that, even if they haven't got their full name, perhaps as attached as their commenting name, but they still feel uncomfortable with it being, uh, with it exposing them. So I think that's a really good example of where you've got to go after the right 
part of the topic basically that it allows a wider conversation to happen and you're not channeling it to, um, into too narrow an area at any one time and um, I mean you've certainly talked to Simon and others who've done it um, does it also work as a small inspirational machine bringing in ideas approaches to certain topics from users that you wouldn't have had yourself in terms of them suggesting what they'd like mm -hmm. to ask about and ask me any things um we do ask about it i think we tend to ask particularly those users who join our virtual events and that actually feeds into some of our focuses around our ask me anything strategy as well so it goes hand in hand because actually we know that it's quite a similar audience that engage with both of those formats um, and we find that that's a very easy way to survey people and really get their opinion um, because they're then coming back on a particular topic that then they can say they either enjoyed or they'd like to see something different or they'd like to see more of something that we might have done in the past, for instance. Um, but I think it's certainly an idea as to whether we would effectively pose that as part of an Ask Me Anything as well, which mm. we haven't really done as yet, which we could we could certainly look at in the future for, for sure. Thank you. Are there any more questions from our attendees? Then this is your last chance to put them in the chat or in the Q&A. Just give you a minute. Half of it. Okay. So, Philippa and Matthew, thanks a lot for your time and for all this inspiring information that you brought to us. If anyone wasn't able to follow everything that we discussed and that you told us, we will have a recording of this webinar on our one front page. It will be done in, I think, two or three days. So, everyone, everybody who wants to follow again this discussion can do that there. Philippa, good luck with AMA sessions. Thank you. The future and make it, making it bigger maybe and gaining a lot of registrations and Matthew um I hope that one or two of our attendees can come back to you or even more and like ask about the tools you know so sure. thank you Martin so um thanks a lot to our attendees for the time and I hope to see you soon again um in another webinar have a nice afternoon bye bye Thanks, bye. Bye. bye.